Welcome to another session of Baseball Pandemic Book Club. Yes, your favorite book club. I'm Tim Wendell, and our guest today is E. Ethelbert Miller. He wears so many hats. Let, let, let's go through a couple of them. He's a literary activist. He's a radio host. He's a writer. He's a poet. And he's certainly a baseball aficionado. His first book of poems was If God Invented baseball. Well, I didn't think there was any question about that. I thought God did. But um, and his latest, which I highly recommend, when your wife has Tommy John surgery and other baseball stories. I, I think I've been down that road in some of my marriage situations, but <laughs> I won't go into that right now. All right. <laughs> Great to have you with us, Elbert. Thank How you. Are it you was good. Always good to see you. Always enjoy our conversation. <laughs> oh, they're always fun. Um, let's start with some. I don't know. We'll, we'll get a little metaphysical here a little bit. What's the link for you between baseball and poetry? Because it's obviously strong. What, you know, define it a little bit for us. Tease it well, out. Well, you know, sometimes in terms of writing, um, you'll hear this in workshops uh, or when you're reading about other writers, you know, write about what you know or write what brings you pleasure. And so, you know, I went back and started writing about baseball because that was part of my childhood. That was part of... Um, um, a neighborhood in the South Bronx um, that was part of, um, you know, friends, you know, when I was growing up. So, you know, when I was looking at how I left New York and, um, you know, went away to D.C. and Howard University and had a literary career, there was a point where I said, okay, well, let me go back, you know, after writing the memoirs and, and um, well, what was happening there in the 50s and 60s, you know, and it was baseball. You know, um, not, I, was, I grew up not far from Yankee Stadium. Uh, I had a very, very large baseball collection um, in terms of cards. Um, and, um, you know, it was something that, you know, my mother was wondering where I was, you know, she knew I was out playing baseball. And, and there was the um, sort of the other thing they grew up with, that you could not play with the ball on Sunday. <laughs> you know, that was just taboo in my household. So it was, uh, you know, like, you know, Monday through Saturday. <laughs> Now, I must admit, and I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm alone here. I'm, I'm now as you describe it, it sounds great, but I'm, I'm hearing some of the advice or I don't know, even criticism of say an old high school teacher going, you can't put this kind of things together. I mean, come on, this isn't, it's not highfalutin enough or something. Right. I mean, what would you say to my English teacher and probably some other English teachers that people remember who are listening to us today? Well, you know, I think what happens is that, you know, if you take things that people enjoy, especially young people, and you say, okay, write about baseball, write about basketball, write about tennis, you find that all of a sudden, you know, they're excited about the subject matter, and that leads them to the, the genre of the form. You know, uh, sometimes what happens is that people are uh, taught poetry, and it's something that's not part of their life. You know, they can't relate to the images, they can't relate to the language. And so I find that, you know, um, today, especially with many, you know, people having these literary workshops uh, for young people, this is where you can pull people in. You know, you begin in terms of what they enjoy doing and say, okay, you may not be on the basketball court or the baseball field, but you're in here writing this poem, which is just as important and requires the same amount of discipline. Hmm. That's, I wish I'd had that eloquent an answer to tell my English teacher back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> speaking, speaking of poems, what's great about having a poet on the Baseball Pandemic Book Club is he can read us some poems and we don't need a ton of setup. And would you, would you read the first one? I'm not going to you know, I, I'm not going to set this one up. I will other ones, but this, this frankly, is one of my favorites. And yeah, this is this is um, Roberto. And um, what I was saying about, you know, growing up in the South Bronx, um, I had a good friend uh, who lived outside the housing projects, you know, when I was in, in growing up in the South Bronx, where the pro housing project that I grew up in, the St. Mary's housing projects, it was predominantly African-American. Outside, you can see a changing neighborhood, you know, early gentrification. And what happened is, is that where many people uh, were from Puerto Rico. And um, my friend Alberto, you know, would come over, you know, to the St. Mary Projects and, uh, and play with us, you know. And he, and he was really a really good friend. And I wrote this poem, which pretty much draws upon an incident that happened. Some kids in the projects didn't have gloves. They caught better barehanded or so they wanted us to believe. Roberto's mother got him Converse sneakers, but they had no star in the logo. He cried until we left him alone. 
It was all his mother could afford. We didn't know this because we were children and had no kids of our own. We had gloves, cheap gloves, gloves with no pockets, no matter how much we kept punching into the center of them. The gloves had missing pockets, like our missing fathers who punched our mothers and swung bats at our heads. Our fathers were gone and we outgrew their absence. Our hands became too large for small gloves. Many were lost or stolen. One winter, we threw and caught snowballs with stiff fingers. Roberto once got me good and kept laughing, saying he was Clemente. That was the year after he discovered he was Puerto Rican and Spanish had yet to melt in his mouth. And so I, I'd say this, Tim, you know, it's the second stanza mm. that I'm drawing upon in terms of memory. Roberto's mother got him Converse sneakers. You know, um, this is long before the Nikes, you know, your Jordans is everything. What happened is that uh, Converse sneakers was the sneaker that, you know, if you your mother was going to give you money to get the sneakers, it was Converse. It had the star, right? The Converse around it. And I remember our brother showed up with his Converse sneakers, but they were cheap sneakers. You know, they, were, they had like somebody had like, like sewn a star on there and didn't have them, you know, you know, you know. And and what happened when I remember when he came out onto the, you know, when we were playing, he was so excited. And then, you know, we took a closer look. And I still remember my friend calls me like, like bowling over, like laughing. Oh man, those things ain't real. And you know, when you're an adolescent, you're trying to fit in. And some things like that happen, it can scar you for life. And, and it was something that as a writer, I went back and, and drew upon because as I got older, I knew this was issues of race and, 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 and diversity, you know, uh, and I began to see how the housing projects were, were, were structured. Um, so that was very important. But then this is also about identity, you know, in terms of, of, of Puerto Ricans, um, who lose the, the language, well, like many Im immigrants. You know, you come here and sometimes what happens is that by the time it's the second generation, the language is lost, mm -hmm. okay? I've, I've known some friends of mine who, who are immigrated to this country and they insist that the language that, the, from the homeland is always spent or spoken in the house. You might go to school and you know, you have your friends and you're speaking English, but when you come back into the house, you're speaking Korean, Spanish, or whatever, but you know, that's just to keep that going. And sometimes it's respectful of all the members in your household who might've immigrated. So all of a sudden what happens, you know, you're in the household speaking English and your grandmother, you know, or grandfather can't, doesn't understand what you're saying. It's somewhat disrespectful and divides that house into certain units. Mm. Well, I think, yeah, that, that's very, very profound. Um, tell us a bit about, okay. You're growing up in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, I'm imagining the Yankees are right. a major part of your life. But, um, you know, talk about the team, my favorite players, and maybe any key moment that, that well, made I, you a baseball fan. Well, I tell you, I tell you what is it, it, a key moment, and it's a opponent will appear in, in, the, in the, the final, you know, third book of this trilogy. Um, when I was growing up, um, I was in PS39 in the South Bronx, on the same uh, elementary school that Colin Powell went to. Um, what happened, I remember maybe around the fifth grade, um, a kid came from the South, George Walker. George Walker. George Tim was black, okay? <laughs> George was, you know, we were saying that we were, no, we, <laughs> we were saying we were Negroes, but, but George was black. I mean, he was the darkest kid that we had ever seen. And a lot of people made fun of George, you know? I mean, uh, maybe this is how Jimmy Baldwin talks about when he was growing up in Harlem, you know, people laughed at, at his features. But what happened, one thing that George loved baseball and he became a good friend of mine with another person, Judy Lou, who like, we all hung out together. And I noticed something that years later, after I majored in African American studies, I, I understood this. George Walker, when he was going to be a baseball player, he was Hank Aaron. He's all these other black players. Me, I'm Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford. Okay, work with me. <laughs> right? And what happened, it would take me years to realize, okay, this guy is these baseball players that he is making reference to. Maybe because he was teased by how dark he was, he was embracing it. Okay, if I'm going to be black and people are going to tease me, I'm going to make sure I'm surround myself with black people who play baseball, you know. I think it was like Tommy Aaron also. I mean, nobody was talking about Tommy Aaron, you know. And what happened is that, you know, you, you draw about these lessons years later when you talk about, you know, what am I writing about? I'm realizing, okay, this guy, 
George, before I went off to Howard and, and made that marine, this guy was teaching me a lesson in black history. Mm. Okay. And 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 what happened? It came about because we're playing baseball. Hmm. Wow, that's wild. A key key moment? I mean, do you, do you go to the games a great deal? Yeah, I went to the I went to the games, you know, and um, you know, we 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 um we stand outside Yankee Stadium, get our autographs, you know, and and that's where you know it's like Hector Lopez, you know, Jim Brown, who I might read I read about, um, and that was very important. That's also when you, you know, your class would go to a ball game and you get like like fifty cents for the bleachers and something like that. But you know those were those were key moments, and I say that because many of my memories of baseball, so like with boxing, is because I heard it over the radio. Okay, so if you look at many writers, you know, like Donald Hall, who's written about baseball, you know, many times, you know, they're listening to the games on the radio. And so the people come become very important for bringing a young person into the sport is pretty much those announcers. So like for me, it's like Mel Allen, you know, going, 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 you know, what I mean, what happened? These the announcers yeah. created the game. That, you know, because you, you know, you're lying in the bed, like, you know, um, you know, you say, okay, well, this, this is what's going on. So, like, you know, I'm supposed to interview David Crowell next week, and he starts out this book, 1962, with the Giants playing uh, um, the Yankees in the World Series. Well, forget about Willie McCovey. I realized Bobby Richardson caught that ball. You know, so, <laughs> you, know, you, know what I mean? <laughs> you know, that's what I'm looking at. And, and, and what happened? I didn't see him catch the ball. I just, like, you know, there's a suspense. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, the game is over. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and I say that because that's baseball. The funniest thing about listening to radio is when you would listen to um, Muhammad Ali or at that time, Cassius Clay fights. Uh, you know, and, and I remember, you know, years later, you know, because I can see some footage now. But, you know, you would listen to radio and they say, listen, swings and Cassius Clay's on the other side of the ring. Yeah, he actually was on the other side of the ring when you see the, the, the thing about it. So I say that in terms of, you know, radio had a lot to do and maybe was even more important than me standing outside Yankee Stadium. I heard about the game before mm. I saw the game. And you were able to create the pictures in your right. head. You know, what you're bringing up, I remember driving around one time and we must have been listening to a basketball or maybe a hockey game. As you know, I grew up near the Canadian border, so I listened to a lot of Canadian hockey. And and the announcer goes, you know, whatever team, they're moving left to right across your radio dial. And my kids cracked up. They thought this was the most ludicrous thing. <laughs> and but I said, no, hang on. He's trying to create a mental picture so you what? can see this. And, and you're right. I mean, I can remember hiding under my covers with my transistor radio and transistor the, radio right trying to get a good reception great nights i could tune in kmox and i go oh, i got st louis this is great right. what are the cardinals doing uh but yeah it's i think you're absolutely right it's somehow you know the power of the spoken word creating something exactly. else. yeah speaking of the power of the uh spoken word um could you read us uh the poem may 28th, 1957, which is okay. You know, awesome. this is this is um, one of the things I'm I'm trying to do, especially in the the third book um, of baseball poems. Uh, I'm going back and looking at uh, history. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, to balance you know my personal experience of growing up in terms of childhood, I also have poems which you know actually document baseball incidents, you know, um, like one incident, for example, that affected me, which was probably maybe the first baseball poem I wrote was Bill Mazeroski. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you're a Yankee fan, you know, you're still weeping about that moment. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I mean, that's how the 60s began for me. I don't know about 1962, but 1960 <laughs> was the one that affected me. So this is May 28, 1957, a short poem. Brooklyn broke down when the bums left. Hearts died in Flatbush. Ebbets feels silent. When I mentioned Duke to a fool in Harlem, he thought I was talking about Ellington. Now, this is one of the beautiful things about poetry, alliteration, okay? Brooklyn broke down when the bums left. So you get that beast down that, that creates that, that line. But in terms of baseball, uh, this is geography, this is New York, okay? What happens is that you're talking about the Dodgers, the Giants, and the Yankees, okay? And what happens is that here, when I mentioned Duke to a fool in Harlem, he thought I was talking about Ellington. Yeah, not Duke Snyder, you know? And this is a whole thing in terms of how, uh, when you say something, depending on where you are, you know, it has a different meaning. I remember one time, Tim, I was in 
Baton Rouge. Me and my friends, I went to New Orleans, you know, I brought a little t-shirt and I, you know, we were on the way to, to Baton Rouge. And, you know, I'm on the campus, you know, there, Southern. And, you know, guy called me, oh man, you from the city? And I said, yeah, I'm from New York. <laughs> and he looked at, I looked at him, I got this New Orleans shirt. I mean, New, New, New Orleans ain't the city, bro. You know, <laughs> unless you trying to get to Dallas or Miami. But what I'm saying is that, you know, if it hit me like, let me a city, this ain't New York. <laughs> you know, anybody, everybody in New Jersey knows that, you know what I'm saying? So then what happened, yeah. So I like the whole thing of Harlem, the Savoy, everybody's into jazz. So you say like, dude, it's Ellington, right? You know, no, man, I'm from Brooklyn. It's this night. <laughs> and so it's, it's a, a way of identity because we know that when the Dodgers leave, something's lost. Yeah, something's right. lost. You know, it's like saying, okay, the Dodgers, the, the Dodgers are gone. You know, what happened to Duke Ellington disappeared? We have no jazz. <laughs> you know, get out of here. You know, somebody give you some country western music. You know, <laughs> which, oh, winds up being, which winds up years later being the Mets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just well, joking. Well, speaking of places, you know, though this past week leading up to our conversation today, you know, suddenly we had the Field of Dreams were playing in the cornfield, all this type of thing. Um, what do you think of that? And, well, uh, and that, that, that shows you, uh, that's another example of why Ronald Reagan, um, I mean, Ronald Reagan, also Donald Trump got elected president. You know, what happened? We, we fall in love with movies yeah. know, the same way we fall in love with movie stars. And so what happens is that, yeah, you know, um, Fields of Dream, it's, it's a baseball classic, you know, like, you know, book, you know, I mean, so what happens is that people, especially now, blur you know, reality with, with the films, okay? So all of a sudden what happens is that, yeah, um, now that's nice. Will Shoeless Joe Jackson get put, elected into the Hall of Fame I mean, because of the movie? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> you know? But what happens, this is what we do. So somebody with the marketing, okay, came up with a really good idea, okay? And and so what happens is that, you know, this is an extension of how, like, you know, you, you want the, the two teams to play uh, against each other, the Yankees against the Mets, White Sox against the Cubs. You you want to have that, so that's like the the regional thing. But then you want to create these whole things in terms. Of, okay, whoa, we can place these players in this field, and they can come out of the corn and you know and talk to us, you know. And I can be James Earl Jones. <laughs> it's always a role for me. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying is that this 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 is where we are. And what happened for some people who love the movie, they watch the game. For some people watch the game, they'll go watch the movie for another generation. Uh, and so, you know, if I had to say which side I come on, come down on, I, I support this, you know, because at the end of the day, it's promoting the sport, however clever we want to do it. And then it's also bringing games to people who maybe they can't make a commute. You know, you know, the, the games, the games that they're going to see is going to be, you know, hopefully a good minor league club. And, and we saw it in the last year, you know, the, the reduction of minor leagues. So there are a number of small cities economically that are going to go through a, a sense of, of collapse because, you know, that that minor league team that had a lot to do with jobs and stuff and restaurants, or whatever, that's gone. So if I have a chance now to see, you know, uh, a Chicago team play, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to that. You don't have any problem selling tickets a year in advance. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite baseball movie? Was it Field of Dreams? Probably no, not. No, Field of Dreams. You know, I really, you know, I really didn't have a a, a, a baseball film. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I mean, I've seen a number of them. Uh, I guess the one that stays in my mind because of the line, you know, I'm always buying them using is League of My Own, League, League yeah, of My Own. Yeah. You know, I'm always telling them, hey, there's no crying in baseball. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how many times I, you know, you know, I've used that line, there's no crying in this poetry workshop. <laughs> <laughs> you know? They're going to take one of your workshops. They sound tough. <laughs> Bringing up Tom Hanks playing yeah. that role. Let, let's go, let's broaden things out a little bit, you know, beyond cinema, I guess. Um, one of the things I think you and I agree on is the profound impact at times and kind of unexpectedly baseball has upon, I guess, the real world, for lack of a better term, you know, upon our society and such. And, um, you know, it's, you know, I had, what was that? I think it was Ken Burns told me one time, it's like sometimes looking at a funhouse mirror, you know, mm -hmm. it's, things get warped and refracted, mm -hmm. but it's still a reflection in some way. And, is that still baseball's role moving forward? I mean, I don't think they jump up and volunteer for it, but does it still play in this day and age? Well, you know, I mean, it does play. I mean, what happens is that we can't separate the games from, from the, the game that we live, 
live in, you know? So, you know, I, I think there's that connection. Uh, I know, for example, I have a poem called The World Series, you know, which is a poem about what's happening in the world. Yeah, would, would you read that for us? Yeah, right? yeah, I'll read that and I'll, and I'll, and I'll walk this you through it. Poem. Right, what you get, what, what, you, what, what this is how this poem is structured. Mm -hmm. um, the World Series. One can go hitless and not understand poverty. A shutout has nothing to do with income inequality. A wild pitch might be a hurricane. An earthquake is when the bullpen collapses. Global warming is a manager pacing in the dugout. War is when players race across the field to throw punches and not pitches. Every year, the World Series is played with survivors. Now, structurally, what happens, you know, one of the things that we look at in terms of poetry, there's the emphasis on the line and not necessarily the sentence on the line, because uh, with a sentence, if I use enjambment, I can just wrap that line around into the second line of the poem. But, you know, what happens is that many times when we look at why people may not like poetry is because what happens, they, they can't find a narrative. They, they want to read something and, and continue. In this case, what happens is that you could say each line is poem on one level doesn't really relate to each other. It, it's a, each line is a standalone line. But now when you step back, just like an abstract painting, you say, oh, I see the whole design. I see, I see exactly what you see. Now that I'm standing back, I get a different perspective. That's how this poem is supposed to work. Okay. Uh, with the key line being every year the World Series is played with survivors because, you know, what happens is that year after the playoffs and the pennant race, yeah, there's going to be two teams. Those are the teams that survive. Okay. That's how the World Series play. Okay. Now what happens is that that last line comes after all these things dealing with, you know, earthquakes, climate change. Yeah. But this is how I like to stack those images. Okay, the same way when you pick up the newspaper, the newspaper contains all these different lines on all the different pages. It's up for you, the reader or citizen, to say, okay, how do I make sense out of the fires in Portland and you know uh, what's going on in, in 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 New York State with Cuomo? I mean, there's a connection somewhere if you find it in terms of you know being able to put these dots together. Now, I'm not talking like I'm part of some sort of conspiracy theory, but you know, finding things. <laughs> <laughs> Scully and Muldoon, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but what I'm saying, it, it is a thing in terms of one, and this is what I used to do actually when I was in college. Me and my friend Reggie, you know, when we didn't go to class, <laughs> we would sit out on the main campus with our newspaper um, and look at the front page and say, okay, how are these stories connected, mm -hmm. okay? How are these stories connected? Like today, somebody would say, hmm, Peru. I wonder if we can connect that to Haiti, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? You know, I mean, what happened here? When you start making these probes and stuff and, 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 and putting things together, yeah, it's almost exactly like how social media works. You know, all these different things are hitting us at the same time. And, it's a, and sometimes it's an overload. We get burned out and we can't make sense of it. But in this sense, the World Series is all these events leading up to the World Series. These are all events going on around the world. That's the World Series. The fires in California and and in the Northwest. That's the World Series. Okay, <laughs> you know, if you if you were to worry about whether we gonna make it through the pennant race, <laughs> well, that's like you know voting rights. <laughs> oh, that's wild. I'm, I'm, I'm flashing on too how uh, oh something like the Beatles' Day in the Life comes to mind. You know, right. the, you know how Lennon. McCartney to a certain extent with that, but Lennon mostly is just flipping through the paper and what's a snapshot today and what's right. a thread that leads right. us. I heard the news today. Oh yeah. boy. <laughs> the news today. Oh man. The news these days has been crazy, but baseball right. will keep me going. Um, you must not be a Nationals fan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, oh, yeah. was a, that, that was a no, reason. I don't know. Play. I turned on the Dodgers the other night. I'm going, oh yeah, <laughs> Trey, Trey Turner's on this team. I uh, broke my head again. <laughs> <laughs> God, one of my favorite guys. <laughs> Me, my mine's too. Um, is baseball still our national pastime? Well, what happens is that you know our our, our society is changing. You know, um, the same way, for example, we we see, for example, when you send the Olympic NBA Olympic um, basketball team over for the United States, it's not necessarily they're going to win. You know, because what happened in the world now? You know, you got some of the best basketball players coming out of Europe. Uh, so what happens is that if I look at in my lifetime, uh, football in terms of soccer has really grown within the U.S. Okay, uh, and become very popular. You saw that in terms of the impact that the women's soccer team had uh, on on say young you know not not just young girls growing up, but it had a real impact. So when you look at where someone is and in, in, in what city or state they're living in and what's a popular sport, you know it's it's not 
um, dominant because the way we receive the games has changed. You know, it's not just one network bringing you a game or, you know, someone highlighting the Cowboys, you know, every Sunday, you know, you, you, you can pick up whatever. If I want to watch, you know, you know, uh, the Utah Jazz, you know, I can, I can find some way of subscribing to that service and I get all those games. And so you're talking about somebody has access to tennis, you know, water polo, you know, you know, you know, you know, you just have a lot to choose from. And then also, if you look at how we've been raising some of our young people, you know, especially, I guess, with the with the suburban moms, you know, you have your kid in five different camps, right? Tennis, this and that, and maybe you can get a chance to play the piano. But what mm -hmm. happens is that, you know, you get so much, it's hard to just say, okay, uh, I enjoy baseball, mm -hmm. you see? And, and this is why sometimes at schools, it's hard to um, have a team because you've got some athletes playing multiple sports. Mm -hmm. Okay, track while the baseball season's going and they, and they have to choose. And then unless there's a name that is dominant, and this is why I usually look up basketball dominates because let's say someone like Michael Jordan, who's a, is, who's a phenomenon, you know, he's affecting the sneakers I wear and everything. So of course that's gonna compete. But then in terms of where, you know, um, the, the, the real battle takes place, we look at the NFL and how that has grown. You know, oh, and, 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 and we like that because what happens, many of those games before it was Thursday night, they weren't Sunday, you mm -hmm. know, they weren't Sunday. And, and, and there was a thing also where the football um, combined with the military ads and stuff like that became very much, you know, America's sport. You know, I mean, we might see a highlight with a plane flight away at the All-Star game, but every Sunday, you know, you know, uh, you get bombarded with these, you know, join the military ads, you know. So what happens if you, if you talk about coming of age and, and wanting to be a good citizen and patriot, what sport is leading you that way? Oh, it's football. Okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, the Yankees were never America's team. They were New York's team, you know, but Dallas, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, and I, and I got a feeling that that whole America thing, the Dallas was somebody doing a, trying to repackage that city after the Kennedy assassination, you know, give us a new image, you know, because at one time you saw, you know, you say Dallas, <clears throat> you think of Lee Harvey Oswald. Sure, sure. Okay, so all of a like Al, right. Al Cooper refusing to tour with Bob Dylan because the next stop is Dallas and he's not going there. So, right. yeah. <laughs> so you know, when we say, you know, what's the dominant sport, some of that has a lot to do with how we grow up and what's being packaged to be the, the dominant sport in the past time. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I'm going to, I'd love to hear another poem and what, you know, poems that you select to be the title poem. You know, right. they got a lot riding on and they got to deliver. And in my mind, this really delivers. So would you please read? Uh, yeah, when your wife has Tommy John surgery. Your wife has Tommy John surgery. <laughs> <laughs> your wife says you need therapy. Her words keep hitting the corner of the plate. You step out of the box and talk to yourself. You already know the next pitch that's coming. It's the argument that leaves her hands with marriage deception. It's the hard, fast stuff, the slamming of a door, the turning of, a, of the back in bed. You can no longer recognize the rotation of love, the spin of desire, the funny movement of lust. Your wife has changed, and now she's seeing someone else. Now, I tell you, um, you always want titles of books um, to be interesting. The same way, you know, I, I, I many times are teaching memoir workshops. And one of the things that I focus on is the first line of a person's memoir, how it pulls you into that narrative, that life story. You know, so tiles of, of books are very important to me. And, I, and this one became one which I kept going back to, like, wow, do women have Tommy John surgery? You know, I was looking for like a, a maybe like a tennis woman, you know, somebody that just didn't come across anybody, you know, like you don't associate Tommy John surgery with women. And but you know what happens when you look at what Tommy John surgery does, how it repairs a person's life and career. I said, well, I know that there's a number of women, you know, who probably want to have Tommy John surgery. You know, I've been trying to look at it. It makes you stronger. I mean, some kids yeah, want yeah, to have it yeah. like in grade school or right. something. Well, you know what happened? You know, I'm a woman. I've been cooking these meals and working. <laughs> two jobs, and this guy is looking at I'm going in here. for Tommy John. <laughs> I'm going in for Tommy John. You know, I, I try to love you. My arm got tired and my love got tired too. <laughs> you know, so, you know, what happens is that, yeah, okay, I, you know, I pull something out my leg and fix my arm or I just get a ticket to head out of here. <laughs> you know? But, you know, this is what happened. And I could only write a poem like this, Tim, 
if I did not come of age as a writer in the 1970s. I tell people, you know, I was motivated to write because of the Black Arts Movement in the late 1960s. But I came of age as a writer uh, in the 1970s. And, and when I look at African-American literature, I always talk about uh, in my talks that the 1970s in African-American literature, you see the feminization of African-American literature, where we might've been dominated uh, by Richard Wright and Baldwin and Ellison. By the time you get into the 70s, you know, now you get your Orvi Lords, you're getting your Toni Morrison, you're getting your Ensataki Shange, it's a feminization. So if you look at social movements, if you wanna look at how we can measure the success of the social movement, then you look at who was against the social movement. So I tell people, if you wanna look at the progress of the civil rights movement, look at white people in the South who, you know, you look up, is that, you know, there's a black person in their family now. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, what happened? They were against, but what happened? The movement changed them. So if you look at writers, okay, especially African-American male writers, if you look at the 70s, you begin to see that no African-American male writer can write, you know, like a Richard Wright. The kids can't do that. So if you look at how August Wilson presents black women on the stage, Oh, you hear their voice. You, you hear Viola Davis talking to Denzel Washington. Let me tell you about this, you know, um, in, in fences. Because what happens is that now the male consciousness has been raised. And so what happens, yeah, there was a point in the 70s um, I used with a lot of persona poems. I wrote in the voice of women. And I wrote about in the voice of women who were dealing with rape. They were dealing with abortion. They were dealing with breast cancer, okay? Because what happened, the social movement had made me very sensitive to those issues. Um. Um, I want you to look in your crystal ball a little bit when it mm -hmm. comes to our national pastime. The future of baseball, and, and I'm, I'm couching this a little bit because you brought up boxing. You know, you and I right. both, you know, watched boxing. I can, you know, Ali, you know, the great fights with Frazier, etc. When I was a kid, and you did too, you know, not long ago, boxing, horse right. racing, horse racing is going through, certainly through some bad times for major sporting events. They've mm -hmm. slipped to the background. Right. How does baseball avoid a similar fate? Well, I think what happens, you have to ask yourself, what's going to drive the, the changes among baseball? Is it going to be the love of the game or is it going to be the marketing of the game? You know, if we see right now, you know, many games are played in, in the evening, you know, in, in terms of the time. It's not, you know, it's not uh, in the daytime. Um, it has a lot to do with, um, how can I say this? It has a lot to do with, tinkering you know right right now we're tinkering with the game we want to speed the game up mm -hmm. well right that gets at the essence of game, base runner on second all this type of yeah, stuff yeah and, and, and we have to ask ourselves what is the beauty of baseball you know it's like for example you know you have some people are against you know like speeding up chess you know, it's, 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 it, you want to be able to say, okay, let me take it in. Let me look at what's happening before this pitcher pitches the ball. Okay. Or for example, one of the, we talk about baseball and, and theater and drama, you know, now I go and going back to how I grew up in the South Bronx, I was a Lewis Arroyo fan more so than a Whitey Ford fan. You know, Whitey Ford didn't pitch no complete games like Bob Gibson, you know, he had Lewis Arroyo, a little lifesaver, you know, he come out. But what happened, you might recall Lewis Arroyo had the jacket over his arm, it was like a gunslinger. The game would open like this, I mean, and, he would, and he would take that long walk in, like, you know, and then get to the mound like it was a saloon. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, but, and, and what happened? You know, there was no walk-in music. There was just Lewis Arroyo coming in, you know? And, and then what happened? Somebody tinkered with that, put somebody in a little, you know, golf court. <laughs> it was not the same. So, can you imagine Clint Eastwood in a in Dirty Harry movie, you know, coming <laughs> you look, you know what I'm saying? You, and make my, oh, get back in the, in the bullpen, make, make my, my day. <laughs> you know, what <laughs> happened? And this is something where if you see how the game adjusts, okay, you want to speed up the game? Now, with an increase of Latino players, like, no, man, let me show you about the bat flip, right? Well, I'm just going to pose and look at this. You want to speed up? No, I ain't speeding up. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stand back like a Picasso, you know, look a little bit. Yeah, speed. You want to speed that up? No, you better not leave that alone, you know what I'm saying? And what happened, somebody in some sort of committee or commission will sit down and say, yes, the bat flip is how many seconds being done that blah, blah, blah. Yeah, the same way you remember how like 
<laughs> you can't do no end zone dance. <laughs> you know, black person. <laughs> and people are working on that more so than the playbook. And you're going to ban that like you're going to ban the drum in Congo Square in Louisiana. No, leave our drums alone. <laughs> leave our end zone things alone and don't mess with the bat flip. Okay? <laughs> so you talk about the future of the game. The future of the game is going to be affected by cultural diversity. You, you can almost look at what will probably will come into maybe a winning. We got a little thing going in the dugout. I can see happening. Maybe with more Japanese players, somebody hits a home run and there's a, there's a moment of, of bowing <laughs> and I say, yes, okay. You think we're losing? No, man, we're, we're coming to a higher force. I don't know what's happening in your dugout. You guys are beating garbage cans. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's not gonna help you win the World Series, <laughs> okay? So you, you, you know that there will have to be an Eastern influence on the game. And hopefully that might slow it down, okay? Mm. It, that that Eastern influence might slow the game down. It might be like Steph Curry taking threes. It changes the game. Okay, mm. you, the same way we can see that Latino players have come in and there's a flair. You know, Tatis is gonna get the little things to the base and do a little thing like that. You know, and, and what happens? That gets picked up by young people. They got the look. They got and they play the game. And that's the asset. Let's let the kids. Let's let the kids play. Okay. Mm. And what happens? They're gonna play, and they're gonna have a different sense of time. Okay, there's certain things they, they don't want to speed up, you know. Because you know, and you, you take power on the nationals. Okay, you want to speed up the game, then the, you can't do a little baby shot. You can't do like a, you can only do like one verse. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what happens? You see, sometimes he takes a long time. He steps out of the box because this guy little things going. Right. <laughs> Are you going to take the little baby shots away? It, 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 <laughs> it's a little group. So, Five people in New York to say, okay, Par is, um, Martina, tell Par he has to get in the box quicker. <laughs> you know, and what happened? When did we have walk up music? Okay, to me, that's like an NBA thing where people had, you know, the slam dunk competition. Mm -hmm. and I think it was Rick Barry's son, you know, people who won one. The you know, whole thing, white boys can't jump. No, he won. And he said before, yeah, I was listening to my little rap music and then like elevating myself. And that, and that, yeah, and you had to have your music mm -hmm. before you could perform. Okay, so people have walk in baseball, they have a walk up song. Now, somebody, I, I want to remember the name, somebody walked up to hit with some sort of Motown slow drag. <laughs> I forgot who that was. Somebody had some like the Dells or something playing. <laughs> Can you imagine you the opposing picture? You talk about, yeah, yeah I'm gonna, gonna throw at his head and he's gonna come here with some Smokey Robinson and Dells music. <laughs> Can you imagine Bob Gibson on the mound with walk up music? <laughs> what, what happened? Bob Gibson or Don Drysdale. <laughs> so, you know, they would throw a ball at your head and then take all your CDs. <laughs> I think they'd throw one up at the organist, too. And be exactly. <laughs> and, and, and see, and, and on a serious note, Tim, this is what happens when you begin to tinker and your thing is trying to attract a new audience, okay? If, for example, people love the game, they'll stay for as long as they want to stay. Okay, and what I look at as 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 a person in my seventies, you know, I I when I go to game, I still look over and I see older couples, you know, keeping the score. They're not looking up a score at the at the at the, the uh, big screen or anything like that. They're keeping, and that's almost like you know, uh, you know, someone who's who's said to be a priest or a monk or something. That's that's how you learn the the game and and and, and keeping score. You don't want to speed that up. You speed that up, you forgot what happened. Yeah, yeah. And yet that's something that's got to be handed down. The last game I went to was uh, at Coors Field earlier this season. My, my daughter lives out there now and my son flew in and he did it without any prompting for me. But, you know, all of a sudden I looked over and he, and he was like he was keeping score and mm -hmm. I taught him how to keep score. And, and, you know, he just rolled it out and he kind of looks at me and smiles. And yet yeah, here's Here's a thread. Here's something that's continuing to go. go see, Tim, when, see, see, Tim, when you say that, right, you're saying that right now in a year in which we see indigenous people worried about the loss of their language. So we hear about the residency schools that where, where young Native Americans were, were taken and they were divorced from their culture and language. And what happens now, uh, because of COVID, like last year, a lot of the elders are dying. Okay. And with them, you look up, a language is dying. And so the whole thing, it's like, you know, look what's coming up. It's like, there's going to be a generation of young people born who can't read the face of a clock yeah. because everything's digital. 
right. like like cursive. Okay, you know, the penmanship. I sign a, it's, I, you know, I'm at the restaurant yesterday, I, and I might as well be a, 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 a newly emancipated slave. I'm, I'm using an X, okay? Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, you know, oh, here's your bill, sign here. And, and you can't really get into the thing because as soon as you touch it, it's writing and stuff. I just do an X, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe Malcolm X knew something was coming. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, so there because I still remember it wasn't that long. It was you know pre-pandemic, obviously, but I was at the Library of Congress doing some research, and you know I'm at one of those tables, beautiful setting, and I look over and here's some guy, and he's got a bunch of letters that must have been or maybe a diary, mm -hmm. and and it's in cursive, right? And he couldn't read it, right? And I was trying to help him read it. I was going. Yeah. I need to really research my stuff, but you know, you know, the, yeah, it's like it's like you know, you you give you give a young African American kid, okay, here's some polar zone dialect poems, okay, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, and you got problem with my rap music. <laughs> <laughs> do poets see the world in different ways that you and I do? You know, I think well, they do. obviously you're a poet, then different than I do. Yeah. I'm thinking kind of the way I knew, you know, I've got a, several photography friends, and I love just talking with them because. You know, they're, they're seeing insights and things that are passing me by. Same with musicians. Yeah, and, and when you say that, same with musicians, all artists see the world differently, you know. And, and what happens on another level, all people are artists. And, 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 and what happens is that understanding this different, how we hear, how we, how we talk, it's all different. But that's the beauty of it. That's what makes us human. We're not all the same, okay. Uh, and what happens is, is respecting that. But what happens is that, yeah, I think that um, poets have a way of influencing our, our society uh, in good as well as bad. I mean, I, I feel, you know, I, I've got a little tired of, of everything being reduced down to couplets, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, to a point that you saw that uh, affecting, you know, political campaigns, you know, little lines and stuff like that. Where's the beef and stuff like that. And, and so what happens is that um, if you look at, poets who have been involved in political campaigns um sometimes they have a lot to do with the uh, slogans mm -hmm. you know uh, i think kerry when he was running for president there was african-american working on uh his campaign who loved langston Hughes, who let america be america again i mean that was sort of taken from from that so when we look at you know the various artists and sometimes uh, the visual artists um you know give you that visual image like you know that whole image that obama had you know, um, and so we have a role because we see things differently. And hopefully because we are artists, writers or musicians, we see things in a very hopeful way, okay? That what we do as, as artists, whether we're painters, whether we're writers or musicians, we give the average person who cannot express themselves a certain way or who don't hear certain things, we do that. We see for those who cannot see, we speak for those who cannot speak. Uh, and, and there's a serious responsibility because at the end of the day, you wanna get it right. Yeah, yeah, very much. With that in mind, would you please read, I, I love this poem, Lost in the Sun. You know, Lost in the Sun. I, yeah, and this is an insight. You know, we're talking about insights. I think this offers a tremendous insight, one of my favorites in the collection. Yeah, th and this one I'll, I'll talk about because it's pretty much the last year or so. Lost in the Sun. Joyful Black fathers throwing their little ones into the air. Years later, a troubling blue sky blankets the world. Black fathers at funerals no longer able to catch their sons. Black fathers no longer standing in a field of dreams. Their black boys gone, sunglasses unable to hide their grief. And you know, one of the things, I don't used to joke about this because <laughs> I was a baby of the family, but you know, there you've seen this so often. Uh, a father, you know, throws and, and catches his kid, you know, it's just, you know, you, you know, it's always a joyful moment, celebratory moment, you know. Uh, I always felt that my, because my, was not a sports family, I was dropped. <laughs> that's why, and, and that's why my SAT scores were low, <laughs> but that's another story, you know. But, you know, I wanted to capture that joyful moment. The same way, for example, if you go back, I think it was 1976, when Roots Phenomena, right? And, uh, and everybody was, hold, black people holding up the little babies. <laughs> then the little group music would go, <laughs> you know. But it was a sense of that celebration and stuff like that. And I said, yeah, that moon hits you in your head, you'd be a lunatic for the rest of your life. But that's another story. But what happened, it was a joyful, it was celebratory, it was ritual. And, and, and what happened, I liked that joy. But then, Tim, on a very serious note, 
I'm always affected by black men, black men. I'm not talking about black black fathers, not black mothers who have gone through a lot with their sons being killed by police. But I'm looking at black men who lost, you know, their their, their children, um, which everything's out of order there. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. Black fathers no longer stay in the field of dreams, um, that loss. And then because it's a baseball poem, you know, because of the games being played many times in the evening, some players come up and they can't play in the daytime games. Or some of the ballparks are designed a certain way where they're not the afternoon game with the sun coming over it is it, it, blinding and so what happens is that that's something when you're out there um and this is almost science biblical yes you 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 are being punished you are you you're you're being tested your faith is being tested you know you're blind you can't see and i you know like i remember um was it Abraham with the son, right? You know, like to show his love, <laughs> you know, he would, you know, sacrifice. And somebody, I remember my friend Margaret asking about my mentor, he said, like, what kind of God would do that? <laughs> you know, what kind of, you know, and, and then I'm said, go, one. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, right. And then, said, and then go get a lamb. And I remember my friend saying, like, well, the lamb wasn't bothering anybody, <laughs> you know, why should he get sacrificed? But what happened, this loss of the son, you know, in the son, and, and, and dealing with grief and, this word on the poem, it's by itself. And I'll tell you this, Tim, I've only seen grief on a friend's face, on a person's face, probably one time. That was my mother when my grandfather died, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, you know, that was when, you know, you go to a funeral and the cemetery and they would lower the body and, you know, sometimes, you know, people want to get down in there. So, you know, at bottom, now what happens is that the family leaves before they lower that casket. Okay, but one time people used to climb in there. They didn't want to let the person go. And I remember I was in a little limo uh, with my father because my father wasn't feeling well. And I looked out the window and my mother was being escorted. It was raining and, and you know, she was sort of slipping in the mud. And I saw her face and I had never seen, it was a face of grief. You know, I had never, I had never experienced that kind of loss um, and I've you know and I say experience it now I've seen it because of TV I've seen these mothers for example who have lost their loved ones you know that they're, 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 they like they say a parent should never bury their child you know and and I remember the uh, I think it was the earthquake in China and you know in many Chinese houses, there's only one child and I remember the elders were saying well who will bury us? Who will take care of us in our, our, our age? Our, our children are gone. It's like, you know, you're talking about the keeping the scorecard. Well, something's out of whack. It's not supposed to happen. And, and so what happens is that, you know, this being blinded by the sun, it's, it's, it's lost. And it, to me, that's a biblical thing. It, it tests you because you have to move beyond the grief. Now, one of the things that holds all my poems together is a sort of like blues aesthetic. There's a blues sense of, of, of that just comes through much of my work. So even in, in the poems that are about baseball and relationship, they're blues poems. You know, mm -hmm. you know when you look at when your wife has Tommy John surgery, that's a blues poem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us, um, um, or close, uh, kind of coming around the clubhouse bend here a little bit, but you're working on a third and final collection. Right, you know, every, like I tell people, I used to joke, I used to joke, I said that everything has a sequel except Catwoman with, with Halle Berry, <laughs> but, now <laughs> now the, but now I'm dealing with a trilogy. And, and I realized uh, on a serious note, Tim, that if my work is going to um, have a presence within the, the, the you know, American literature, I had to do something that, that's unique. So I know many people, you know, have a poem about baseball. They have like Marianne Moore has a poem about baseball. Um, but I, I think what I'm doing in terms of a trilogy, you know, um, it holds up and it, and, and, and it says, okay, this is a way of looking at baseball from so many different angles. Okay. And one of the things I'm doing now is, is more history. Uh, I'll read you the poem I just wrote today, which I rejected. Oh, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. This, 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 I just wrote this today. And then uh, this will be I'm, in the, uh, now the this will be, this will be in the, I haven't given the title to it yet because maybe the title will come um, from a poem that I have yet to write. Um, uh, I, I did, <laughs> this is analytics, this is analytics. So tell this one, analytics, right? This is this one, 21. So I took a few titles 
sent them to a couple of people to get their input. <laughs> and they among the which ones they liked. They didn't like most of any of them anyway. You know, that's analytics, <laughs> you know. <laughs> where, where, should, where should I position the title? You know, anyway. But what happened, this is um, Emmett Ashford, um, first African-American umpire, mm -hmm. um, died in 1980. And you got to go back. I was looking. I can't find video of Emmett Ashford. You know, he was just flamboyant. Emmett Ashford. I call balls and strikes the way John Coltrane plays my favorite things. Folks come to the game to hear the sound of my music. Some batters stand in the box like bass players who don't know how to play. If I'm not behind the plate, I'm dancing in the infield, calling runners out and safe like James Brown sliding across the stage. I've had managers run from dugout, orange protests, and screaming. Please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's brand new. <laughs> That's wow. brand new. I wrote, I, wrote that, I wrote that this morning. You know, I woke up and, and, and what happened, show how I write, I write. I had the line, I call balls and strikes the way John Coltrane plays my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things is that if you talk, if you don't even like jazz, you know, you take what um, Kali saw us at Melody and had he just, takes that out and brings that back. And, and what I like is a line like, folks come to the game to hear the sound of my music because that song has come from the you know, sound of music. Right, so right. All, you know, all the things are tight. And then I had to figure out, okay, if I move Ashford from behind home plate in the field, how do I find a, a musical reference? And so I, 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 I fell back on the James Brown and then I um, put the whole thing, please, please, please. Now I could have messed up my poem because I had, a, I was thinking, okay, I got James Brown here. I got to get Maceo. <laughs> Maceo, <laughs> bring my back. <laughs> you know? So, you know, that's where you workshop these things and you leave that out. <laughs> that's in another poem. <laughs> yeah, that's in another poem, right. Well, well, tell us a little bit. Um, you were saying that the a lot of the, the, the new collection, not the one that's coming out, but the one that's coming up, Black Sox scandal. I mean, right, uh, right. You know, I, and I tell you why, and I'll just read one of these. I, I got a couple, but I just read one. The, okay. the, what I stumbled across was this: my mother was born in 1919, and my mother was always talking about. Yeah, not only was she born in in 1919, she was born September, which is the ninth month, and she was born on the on ninth, the 19th of September. So that's 9 19 1919. So you don't mess with her. You know, you won't eat your food. Look, let me tell you, <laughs> 9, 19, 19, 19. <laughs> and so what happened, that got me into the thing. I said, wow, my mother was, you know, um, you know, this is going on, you know. But then the 1919 was also early in the summer, the race riots of 1919. So I have this poem called Chicago, Red Summer of 1919 before the Black Sox scandal. White men throwing stones, not balls at black people. Black people at the beach, not wearing socks or shoes. Eugene Williams was not a fan of violence. He was a victim, drowning like a player caught in a rundown, cheated out of his life. In the alphabet of history, riot comes before scandal. Wow. And, so, and so in this poem, you know, I, I'm dealing with this, 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 this Red Summer 1919. Okay, this is before the Black Sox. This is before these guys are getting together in September of the, the Soda World Series. Uh, I actually bring Eugene Williams, who was killed. You know, he drowned because they were throwing rocks at him to keep him on one side of the beach. And so in that sense, the poem documents that. But then the baseball really works well, where it says, you uh, drowning like a player caught in a rundown, cheated out of his life. And that goes back to the Black Sox game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the poem, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that it's layered that I try to write poems that if I'm teaching the poem in a class, I can teach the various depths and levels of the poem, okay? So what happens is if a poem works, um, the reader comes away with one or two lines, okay, that resonates, that goes beyond that, or, or might bring you back to the poem. Because one of the things that's different between um, poetry and prose, you have to come back you know, you know, I, you know, and, and, and when you come back to the poem, it's not like this microwave, you're gonna heat it up again. No, you gotta come back and experience it anew. You know, you gotta make it again, <laughs> you know, and then take it apart. You gotta say, okay, what makes this go? What brings me back? You're saying, what brings me back? So for example, in 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 this poem about um um uh, Emmett Ashford, what brings me back is I call balls a strike the way John Coltrane plays my favorite thing. That, that brings me back to the poem. You know, that makes me want to put my favorite things on. 
Okay. Uh, and so you, I, when I'm teaching poetry, I always tell a, a reader or, or someone in the, in the group, find the window in the poem, find or the door in the poem. What, how do you enter the poem? It, does, it doesn't have to be in the first stanza. It might be in the middle. Okay. But there has to be some place that when you enter that line, like a room and a stanza is a room, you move around in it and you might say, oh, wow, you know, I can put my feet up in here. I like this. You know, but you have to feel comfortable. Or you might get in a room and, and you say, I can't get out of here, man. Who put the pictures on the wall? I'm getting out of here. Was it Ezra Pound? <laughs> you, get out of here. you get out of here quick. <laughs> you know? Somebody open the door. Let me open the door. But see, then someone will say, if you think that's a door. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, this has been this has been great. You talk about being a window. You've been not only a window upon our national pastime, but Gosh, I wish I'd had you explain some poetry to me when I was well, back. Well, see, I tell you, you know, you've, you've been, you know, um, you've been one person that I, I um, that has influenced my work because if it wasn't our friendship, uh, I don't know if I would be writing more baseball poems. So I just want to thank oh. you for, for encouraging me. And a lot of that comes from, you know, interviewing you and, and I think, you know, how you saw um, baseball as being helpful to understanding things in your own family. So I, I and, and we had talked about this when we had a conversation you know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you know when I think about a community of writers and how writers interact, you know I don't take you know my my friendship with you for granted. I, I'm always learning, looking forward to your next book. You know, um, and and um, there was things I, I I picked out in the last novel. I said, wow, this is interesting with the cartels and stuff. And so I'm always learning, you know, uh, from you. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful. And vice versa. And. I'll catch up with you soon, my friend. But uh, I just want to say thank you to E. Ethelbert Miller. Hang on, we got to hold up the side. <laughs> okay. so, we <laughs> this is out very soon, right? And this is and this is coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's coming next year. But yeah, and and if you feel like waiting, get that one too. So right. thank you. But I um, always love our conversations. I mean, your your sense of our time, your sense of humor, and certainly your love of baseball. Okay. So, well, thank you. Yeah. So this is Tim Wendell with the Baseball Pandemic Book Club. Thank you all for tuning in and listening to E. Ethelbert Miller.